Hello, and welcome to a three-hour safari with my ugly mug as the starring feature. Well, with any luck, we'll be finding some animals, so you won't have to stare at me for the full duration of the safari. You are, in case you have stumbled across this website on your Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, you are with Wild Earth, and you are currently receiving what I am saying well, about four or five seconds after I've said it. So to all intents and purposes, you are on a live game drive safari here in South Africa in the wilds of the Greater Kruger National Park. And you are most welcome. We love having you along. If you've stumbled across us by mistake, don't go anywhere. Go and put the kettle on or pour a snifter or whatever it is you like to do. Sit down and enjoy the wonders of the African wilderness as brought to you by Wild Earth TV. My name is James Hendry, and I am hanging in a knobthorn tree. And behind us on camera today, we have Brian the Inimitable Thumb, uh, with his uh, very sort of, I mean, he's looking quite holy with his beard and, uh, and long hair at the moment. Then in the final control room, we have got Tara Dales, and a new addition today, that being Jessica from Johannesburg. Then also, if you happen to be watching the Juma Dam Cam, you will see that there are two people, in fact, on the back of Wendy this evening, this morning, afternoon. And the other person is not Brian or VM or Andrew. It is, in fact, Louise. And Louise, there we go. She's just giving a bit of a wave there. Louise is uh, also one of our associate producers, and she's along on Game Drive for today uh, before she heads back to the wilds of Johannesburg, which are infinitely wilder than the wilds of the Kruger National Park. So. Um, if you would like to interact with us, and we encourage you to interact with us, hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting away like a white browed scrub robin, which I can hear from here, or if you happen to be on the email, questions at wildearth.tv. Um, I am hanging in this tree for a purpose, uh, well, two purposes. Firstly, because uh, I wish to tell you a little bit about South Africa from here. It's quite a sort of... Um, it's a warm afternoon, so it's about 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees centigrade, and so there's not a huge amount of animal activity at the moment. So we'll start off slow with a bit of introduction to the, to the country, and I'm also standing up here because I planted a leopard orchid seed or pot in the tree a little while back, and I just want to see if it's actually started to grow. And I can tell you that it hasn't started to grow. I did check before I climbed this tree, um, but it was planted in a hole just over here, where my left hand is now uh, pointing, and it hasn't sprouted any roots yet, which is a bit of a pity, and the leopard orchid is something uh, called an epiphyte, which means it lives in a tree without causing any harm, um, and it survives off the air, it survives off rain, it falls into it, and then when it gets big enough, it forms a basket, and bits and pieces of detritus and bird dung and other things like that help it to survive the wilds of Africa. So like I said, we're in South Africa, and um, way off to the west, we're bounded by the mighty Atlantic Ocean, which crashes into the west coast of South Africa, a blustery place, um, where Cape Town forms the sort of southern tip, and that goes into this incredible biome called the Fynbos, which has thousands of species not found anywhere else in the world, uh, plant species that is. Very small biome in the mountains around Cape Town and the Western Cape, and as we move east from there, up the coast, and into the interior, we get the Karoo, which is a mighty expanse that used to see possibly the greatest mammal migration in history. Millions and millions of springbok used to roam that area until we put up fences and started farming sheep, like, well, just like humans, I suppose. North of that, the mighty Kalahari and the famed huge lions of the Kalahari with their great big black manes. And from there onto the high felt and to the grasslands of the Free State, and up into what is now Gauteng, and those are where the grasslands were, and also lots of high fields, different species now, lots of farmland, and then to the mountains, and away from the alpine grassland that sweeps down to the east where we are now, in the low felt. And this is the iconic bush felt that so much has been written, filmed, sung, and uh, proselytized about over the many years that people have been traveling into this area and indeed living in this area. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea where we are. And the Kruger National Park is in the Lofelt area, 450 meters above sea level. 
and low fault if you don't happen to speak Afrikaans, which will be probably 99.98% of you, that means lowland, and that's where we are now. So, I am now going to depart this tree and attempt not to do myself an injury. There are some buffalo over there, so I'm going to ask Brian to face the camera toward them, so that should I come a crapper, all you will hear is a dim squeal while you watch the buffalo. See you just now. Hello, Brian, I made it. Oh, good job. Dude. Yes, well, you know, one does what one can. Right. Squeezing onto a pile of cushions here. I'm not large of stature, of course. If I were to sit without cushions, you'd probably not see me at all. Right, so those are two buffalo bulls languishing here in the mud. One of them was rolling just before you came live, and you can see some of the mud stuck on the top of his horns. And why they're lying in the full sun, I was just asking Brian why he thought they would be doing that, as opposed to in the shade, and I don't know, because it's pretty hot. There's no wind to speak of. Very sort of gentle breeze, perhaps, on top of the crest areas, but nothing, nothing to speak of down here. So I'm not really sure why they would be sitting in the sun. Anybody who has any ideas on that, we'd love to hear from you. Remember, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Those buffalo will be chewing away at the cud and just sort of enjoying the peace of this lovely mid-afternoon. So while we look at those buffalo, thank you Lynn, Paul and Kathleen for your speculations as to what I might achieve on Game Drive today. Um, I shall try to uh, basically do what all of you have asked. I shall try to give you some information you don't know before, you haven't learned before. I shall try and to uh, perhaps uh, create some sort of smile on your face. That will be a good bonus. Um, and basically we're going to have a lot of fun, I hope, this afternoon. And I do just want to reiterate that I learn normally as much as I give out during these drives and so it is wonderful to hear from you and thank you for your comments and please keep them rolling remember <laughs> it's only Brian and I out here of course in the very quiet personage of Louise right I think we've probably milked that buffalo sighting for all it's going to give us at the moment and we're going to press on um, the general plan of the afternoon will be to head up onto the northern boundary, the Biffles Hook cut line. There was some wild dog activity just north of there this morning, if you weren't on drive. Um, they didn't come down into Voyatella, but because wild dogs are diurnal, they may well be moving around still, well probably not this time of the day, but they might have come down late morning. So we're going to pop along there, see what we can find, head along to Biffles Hook waterhole, see what we can find there. And then we may well head across to Arethusa, where there have been reports of the Matimba male lions and some of the Styx pride. And as many of you will know, the lions are in a state of abject flux at the moment. Huge ructions going on with the approach of the Birmingham Five um, males. And Brent, Leo Smith and I were just having a sort of dig at each other today. Uh, not a physical one, of course. Um, and Brent was just saying how he loves it when the young bucks come in and toss out the old boys. And I quite like it when the old boys give the young bucks a bit of a run for their money against expectation. I suppose that uh, that sort of preference comes with the, the onset of age. Right, here we go. Brian, are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, good. Strap yourself in. Louise, remove your dentures. Here we go. I 
I did threaten Brian with doing the entire game drive from the top of that dead knob thorn tree. Um, and he, he very gamely said, okay, well, if you want to, you go for it. Probably a bad idea. So as you can see, the water is starting to lessen quite a lot. You saw from the waterhole where we were stopped earlier, well, the same waterhole, of course. And we, apparently you had a bit of a guess, guessing game with, with uh, Brent the other day as to whether it would dry out and when it would dry out. And Brent guessed 31st of August. And I believe we have Asif and Stephen to thank for the updates on the lions at Arethusa. Thank you very much for, for that. And I'm constantly astonished at the commitment, enthusiasm and joy that is derived by our wonderful audience. And I mean, you don't only watch us, of course, you watch what's going on in the Facebook profiles of all these animals that we have here. And you watch the, the dam cams and any information that you can get out here, you, you sort of leap upon it. And it's wonderful and I hope that a lot of you will be able to come out here one day and see us and if you don't see us you'll certainly be able to see the magnificence that is this beautiful area. Yeah. Now in case you weren't with us yesterday or this morning um, we are only one vehicle out today, like I said earlier, and that is because uh, after two days of following Cheetah and Wild Dog through the bush, Wendy and Jigger went on strike briefly yesterday. We managed to conjole Wendy, which is the vehicle I'm driving, uh, into some kind of functioning order yesterday afternoon. Um, I wouldn't say she's in tip-top shape, uh, but she's better than Jigger. Uh, which is, who is sort of lame, I think is the best way to describe her. Her left front wheel is a, well, just not in a good state, really. And that comes from, I think, you know, inevitable wear and tear, following wild dogs off-road and following cheetah off-road. They move quite quickly, you see. We're not out on the reserve completely alone, of course. There are, will be one or two other game drives out a bit later. And I may have to excuse myself to talk on this radio. And that radio will let us know if anything is found on June. A couple of elephant tracks. Find it at the map, probably not at that angle. If I go back a little bit, can you see them at all? A little bit. We just have a quick look at the elephant tracks here. They're not very well, some of them are quite new. In fact, let me go and get out and show them to you. large feet I suppose as would be expected from a six ton animal and you, I don't know if you can see there's a little indentation here uh, Brian is indicating a little bit of a sight and that's the toenail as it grips into the into the ground as the animal moves and so the elephants moving that way there is a tire track over the top of it though so I think it was probably from very early this morning and we certainly heard a lot of elephants around here this morning. I don't know if you saw any, um, but they were around here probably having a drink. That looks like the track of a young bull. Right, on we go. Let me smell that the elephants have been around here. You can all 
also see it from the amount of it looks like sort of gardening refuse that is on the ground on the road and off-road So just on the subject of those wild dogs, there, there were five of them north of us today, and so I'm not really sure where they came from. Um, there might be a pack up north in the Manuleti. Uh, yesterday we had three males, which we think was probably some kind of dispersal pack, and Brent sent through a number of photographs to the wild dog guys who run a lot of the research that goes on on wild dogs around here. Ooh, beef for those. That is classic buffalo behavior. We've given them a bit of a fright. They run a little bit, and then they turn around and look. And they lift their noses to the air to see if they can smell whether we're a threat or not. They say buffalo, I've said this to you before, but they say buffalo look at you as though you owe them money. And that's exactly what that look is there. That's why they, that's why they have that reputation. They also, from here, probably look enormous, and they do look very big. <laughs> There's one behind us that's... Um, I think he's injured. Brian, can we just flick around and have a look at him? He looks a bit more nervous than this chap does. There he is. And see the flies perhaps as we zoom in on him he's thousands of flies erupting off him yeah his hips are very yeah he's definitely limping along and i think we've seen him around gary dam a few times so he is not long for this world i'm afraid if the lions come across him or indeed a big clan of hyena he will be in some trouble anyway i was just saying that they look pretty big and indeed on foot they are intimidatingly large but we watched them yesterday or two days ago with a huge bull elephant he came past the dam and he watched um, he walked up behind them and he actually one of the bulls gave him one of the buffalo a little tap on the backside with his with his trunk and it was astonishing to see the size difference between an 800 kilogram buffalo and a six ton elephant bull and it made them look like it just made them look almost insignificant. So the elephants really are astonishingly sized. And I think we kind of forget that because if we see them in a herd, kind of think of them as we lose perspective on how large they really are. Bye bye buffalo, stay out of trouble. we drive up towards the cut line where there was news of the wild dogs earlier and we will be watching for tracks of course um, oh elephant <laughs> let's forget the wild dogs for a little while and enjoy these elephants so I'll just stop here and we'll have a look and we'll have a listen to see who is around Ryan is that okay for you there We'll go off road but let's just have a listen so whenever we see elephant the best approach is to just stop first have a listen see who else is around make sure everything is is okay because what you don't want to do is drive into the middle of an upset herd of elephants because you can get yourself into a bit of trouble you can see that elephant we well, can't see it right now but that elephant has got a very sort of uh, recurved tusk goes out to the left hand side it's the left hand tusk I can't hear any others it's not to say there aren't any around so it looks like a young bull and I think I'm just going to try and approach him carefully through the bush 
We won't go too far off road. A because we don't want to frighten him, and B because Wendy is, uh, well, you know, she's not quite functioning at her best. Brian, I'll just head off here. We can't get a better picture. Come on, old girl. He's now hiding from us, of course, behind this bushel. stop here for a little while and we'll just see if he decides to come out or not. I can't really blast through this stuff. Once again you can see how brilliant the colour grey is to be out here. So this kind of shiny khaki shirt that I'm wearing is uh, very nice in theory but basically completely pointless in the bush. Grey is the colour you want to be if you truly want to be camouflaged. There are lots of extremely fashionable rangers knocking about the low felt, um, all of whom are about as obvious as a luminous pink beacon. It's entirely, I'm not really sure why he's I mean, he's a young bull, so that he should be on his own, but normally bulls of this age have got others similarly aged around them. Not a great view. And I can just hear him eating the last of the grass. I'll tell you what, Brian, let's try and go around the front of him. We won't have to go through this thick stuff here. in front here and go around and have a look. He's walking sort of towards us now. Patience, patience. We normally get good pictures. Heads. There are lots more elephants just down here. There he is. I have given him a bit of a fright, I'm afraid, but he's okay. He does not look in great nick to me bones showing. He really does look a little bit skinny. And this of course is a tough time of year for them that you know that vegetation is not growing nicely. Well it's not growing at all. Uh, grass is very dry, water is starting to dry up now. Um, having to eat almost exclusively bark now. And quite interestingly, he is trying to eat grass, and I wonder if he doesn't have some issue with his teeth. We had a very, very dry year this year. Probably about a third, well, two thirds of the rain we normally get, and in this area, that's really not a lot. And Raisa just pointed out that she's read that El Nino, which of course is the weather phenomenon that um, doesn't plague this area, but certainly does affect this area hugely, um, is progressing as forecast. Now, of course, forecasting weather is a little bit like forecasting the outcome of a lottery. Um, but as Raisa says, the, we are forecast a very dry summer. So, things are okay as we stand now, but come October, 
uh, just before the rains start, or hopefully in November they will start, it's going to be very dry. But the real suffering, if there is suffering, is going to come in the next dry season, when the water table isn't replenished by a very dry year of rain. So, yeah, it's getting tough now. It's going to get a hell of a lot tougher in 365 days if we have, as predicted, a very dry, wet season. Let's go a little bit forward. There's some other elephants there. What's wrong with him? Attempts not to break windy further. Put your heads. Oops. Under the aerial. Still with us, don't worry. Little elephant coming to have a quick look at us. Just sticking the trunk up to smell, and probably just getting a trunk full of petrol fumes, as opposed to any indication of what we really are. Now what I'm going to do is ask Tara to turn up the microphones and I'm going to talk very quietly, if at all. And I just want you to have a listen to the astonishingly tiny noise that the elephants make. So you can probably just hear the odd leaf being rustled past. You'll hear the odd piece of branch being broken off. But otherwise this herd of roughly, let's say, ten elephants is almost completely silent. You can just see that's one of the consequences of a dry year. You can see that tree. Well, you can probably see the elephant as well. But the tree there with its white around the trunk. That trunk has been attacked by elephants. Elephants have pulled off the bark and eaten away the vascular tissue. And that tree is dead. And it's dead because the tree is completely ring barked. No carbohydrates can go down to the roots and no water can come up to the leaves from the roots. Well, not there are any leaves now, and that's a knobthorn. That's a very common fate for a knobthorn tree. Very young elephant walking through there. Right, and I'm going to try perhaps and get around to the side there, and we'll get a slightly better view of them all. 
marvellous. Right, here we go. It's a young bull walking to the right of us. Same one we saw when we came in. Is that right? So I really have parked Brian behind the bush there, but I don't think he wants to be seen. Let's see what he does with this tree. Yeah. <laughs> And that is the fate of many acacia trees out here. And without that, of course, the bush would be a huge amount thicker than it actually is. So while he looks like he's doing damage, which of course he is if you happen to be looking at it from the perspective of that acacia nigrescence, um, his function out here is extremely important. Without them, there really are a key... This is lovely. This is a young bull. I hope nobody has to ask me how I know he's a young bull. You can tell he's a young bull, can you, Brian? Well done. It's the shape of his head. It's the shape of his head, exactly. Well done. And the direction of his tusks. And the young bulls, just like human beings, I'm always astonished at how similar they are to sort of young, young buck men. He's just coming to have a look, see what we want. Just seeing if we're a danger, will we move from him? That truly is quite astonishing. I do find it amazing how they managed to walk in such a state of um, exposure without doing themselves some serious damage on a knobthorn tree. He's just walking around us, pretending to feed, having a look. He's probably, I would put him, I would put him at roughly mm, 17 years. I mean, that sounds like quite a specific number, but I think he looks a bit bigger than uh, 15. And 20's kind of, he's also got a bit of a runny tummy. Uh, 20 is kind of probably a bit, I think 20 year old's bigger than that. So I'd say 17 years. And when he's somewhere around now, he will go into his first, what we call must. And must is the sort of heightened testosterone time for young elephants like this. And it's when they will eventually try and mate. But a young must bull, and I mean that first must can last a couple of days and probably won't even be noticed. But they go into extended periods of must once they hit sort of 30, 35 years. So if he goes into must now and tries to mate with a female, I'm sure a much bigger bull will come in and give him a royal hiding. I don't think he's long for the herd at that age. Right, shall we just we'll go off towards the rest of the herd now? I'll try and get a bit closer to them. Two bulls might have a go at each other here, Brian. Sorry. I'll just drive a little bit closer to them. Here we go. Look at that. Two bulls just having a little bit of argy bargy.
lots of different noises around an elephant herd, the grumbling, the sort of trumpeting, and then they do scream. That kind of loud screaming is not always trumpeting from the trumpet. I'm just trying to see as they walk off together if there's any real difference in their condition. I don't think there is, you know. I think they're both in pretty similar condition. I think the dry season is taking its toll. All right, will you ex excuse me for one second? I'm just going to talk on the radio quickly just to give everybody an update because the lodges in the area are starting to get mobile. There's a great deal of yakking on the radio that goes on. Texon Gunatin Lob Fuleka Mvub Road Tija Kwalan at Farm D. Yeah, and the co Matlolo Ama 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 Lulanga. Uh, okay, copy, thanks. All right, I'll give you that update now. Um, Right, so lovely question as we look at the golden sort of afternoon light dancing off that uh, guari bush there. Ellen, you want to know, is that an evergreen tree and will it remain green? Ellen, absolutely it's an evergreen tree. It is called a Euclid divinorum or magic guari bush. And you'll notice that elephant, hungry as it is, totally bypassing it because it tastes like nothing on earth. In fact, I have one just next to me here. And Ellen, these, as I've said a couple of times, there you are, Louise. Brian, you may have one too, if you want one. Um, you don't want one, Brian. I do want one. You do, there you are. Uh, these leaves are really horrible. They're full of chemical defensive mechanisms to stop them being eaten. And the gory bush is the most effective of that. They really taste bitter. Hmm? Both of them very tanniny. Mm. And dry out the mouth. And so the elephants will bypass them just about every time. So there are a few evergreens out here, Ellen. And most of them have to defend themselves with chemicals as opposed to with thorns like the acacias do. Um, I was just talking on the radio there with Taxon, who's a ranger from Vuyatela, and he was just telling me that the wild dogs were coming towards here uh, this morning, and so he's going to go and check where they were last seen, because he's allowed north of us, and he'll keep us posted on what's going on there. Let's just try and move a little bit round the front of them there. Mouth is a bit dry after the quarry bush that I tasted. Full head here, Brian. Nasty thorns. Yeah, Brian's still with us everybody. Doesn't won't do to leave your cameraman hanging on a tree. The elephants have used this area quite extensively over the last little while. It's really been kind of flattened down. We're going to attempt to cross this knobthorn tree in front of us. 
so it is going to be a bit of a bump. Oops. <laughs> we might have to go around it. <laughs> Wendy would normally manage that no problem. Slightly embarrassing, but we'll get over it. Right, there we go. Wendy, nasty little cow. view of them eating, I'm trying to crunch away at the... various bits and pieces of stick that they have to eat. I was just saying, when we saw that one who I said didn't look that healthy, I did see him trying to eat grass and I wondered if he didn't perhaps have a sore tooth or something like that that made eating sticks like this very difficult. You can see how the teeth must take an awful hammering, chewing away at the sticks like they have to. Amazing how important the tusk is. You can see there it's helping to break the stick. Looking at the back end of that elephant there, will you just get on the tail there, Brian? There we go. Dennis in Lakeville, Massachusetts. Uh, I wonder what Lakeville is like. It sounds like quite a nice place to be. Dennis, um, you want to know what that's for, basically. You can't really figure a point for the tail. Well, look at the hairs on the end of it. Um, and I think it's the same as many tails out here. I think it's a general fly swat. Uh, and just to help with itches at the back that perhaps the animal can't reach. It is very whippy. Can they survive without one? I suspect they probably can survive quite nicely without them. Um, but it is an extra help against ectoparasites and things that might affect an elephant and give them disease. And Brian, if you get to the other one, the one in front there has got a spectacular amount of hair on the bottom of her tail. There she is. Just see her tail swishing every there we go. Look at the really impressive sort of array of hair there. And that hair, I've I've had it in my hand before, not that particular elephant. I, mean, I don't think she'd take kindly to me walking up and pulling a sample out. But it is very thick, extremely thick, very wiry thick, and sort of I think very effective as a fly swat, especially when wielded with enthusiasm. But I don't think nearly as essential as it is perhaps on, say, like a giraffe. And they use their, they use their tails extensively to try and get rid of flies. Still trying to eat grass. If they can eat grass, remember elephants will, will graze if they can. so close to us. You see amazing the way their feet work in tandem with the trunk. Absolutely incredible. I'm 
I've always struck at how nimble they are. We tend to think of them as being sort of lumbering and perhaps, I don't know, unagile. But to watch them doing stuff like this and then when you see how the steep slopes that they're able to climb, it takes away any notion that they're not nimble. Massive as they are. There are a lot of flies around here at the moment. And she's, oh, he's now probably, what, 15 meters from us. So we'll just wait and see how close he's prepared to come. Just giving us a little smell every time he picks a piece of grass. Shaking off the dust and the sand. Putting it in his mouth and repeating the process. And you can see he turns his trunk the same way every time. And they say that elephants, like being left-handed or right-handed, will have a preference as to which way they turn their trunks. And this chap is always going sort of from right to left, from right to left. And that tends to wear down one side of the trunk versus the other. Probably not at this age. He's eating a very important grass in South Africa. If you happen to be interested in grasses, which is probably about maybe half a percent of you, um, that is called red grass or Thamida triandra. And if you've got that growing around where you live or in your farm or on your game farm, means your rangeland is in fine condition. You can see that's what the elephant is selecting now. It's a very good grazing grass. Constantly amazed out here at how um, how confiding the elephants have become, and I have mentioned this before. But you know, 10, 15 years ago when I started out here, we reversed into elephant sightings and made sure that we had a forward escape route at every time. Sometimes we didn't turn the car off at all because we knew we would have to make a hasty escape at just about every elephant sighting. Because in 1996 they stopped the culling of elephants in the Kruger Park. And elephants still used to associate people uh, as highly threatening things, and vehicles especially. These days, you can drive into a herd of elephants, and you must never take this for granted, but you can drive into a herd of, herd of elephants, and if you watch their behavior carefully, it's really not, it's not an issue to be close to them anymore. They tend to have grown a, a level of trust for us, which is just so wonderful. To be able to sit this close to an elephant is spectacular. Lovely little breeze now starting to blow off the tops of the ridge crests here and just cooling it down a bit. It has been a very hot day for winter. So as Raisa pointed out in Finland, El Nino is doing its thing and we're really not having a very cold time of it. watching the trunk of this elephant dexterously pulling stuff out of the ground. There is an elephant, as I mentioned just a little bit before, with a half trunk. Well, not quite half trunk, but you certainly had the, the prehensile tip of the trunk has been lost. 
It may have been from predation as a youngster. It may have been she was born slightly deformed. It may have been, I don't know what happened. She may have just been infected as a baby. And Blue Jay Zumi, uh, I'll explain what Zumi means just now. Blue Jay Zumi says, have we seen her around recently? Yes, we have. I saw her two days ago when Andrew and I were sitting on top of Gari Dam Wall and we watched a huge a lot, um, we watched a huge herd of elephants there for a long time and eventually we noticed the one with that missing piece of trunk and she gets on fine you know she she doesn't she's not able to be as dexterous with her trunk as this young bull is in front of us twisting it and picking things up but what she does is she wraps the top half of the trunk round and then she'll use her tusks or just like this one's doing she'll use her feet to get it out to pick whatever she wants to eat And if you perhaps don't know what a Zumi is, a Zumi is one of our faithful followers who operates our dam cams or waterhole cameras around the world and they, they take turns to zoom in and out of different wildlife highlights and without them of course the dam cams would be half as entertaining as they are. So we thank them for their work and just to give them a small, little bit of a shout out because they inadvertently do quite a lot of work for conservation of these wild areas because the more people enjoy them, the more p exposure they have to the amazing animals and landscapes of a place like this, the more of course the lobby will be to protect them and protect the creatures that live here that so need our help. I think we should probably nip a little, well, I don't know, no, let's just wait here a little bit longer. I want to see what this young bull does. Not the, not the one in picture, he's just pretty much doing the same as this one. Ooh, one of them's talking now. There's a big cow behind us. And she's just giving a bit of a rumble. As if to say we need to move off. Or maybe she's warning this young bull and saying, don't get too close to those smelly bipedal things. Elephant communication remains something of a mystery. We do know a bit about it, but we certainly don't know the individual things that they say to each other. And it is amazing how sometimes a herd like this will be feeding and suddenly they'll go completely silent. And then they'll start to move off. And that's because there's been some kind of infrasonic communication and infrasound means basically that it's a, he's just giving us a bit of an eyeful. Infrasonic means below the frequency that we're able to hear. Now that's interesting, he did that as the breeze blew from behind us and into his nose. So they definitely react to the smell of human beings. Their eyes are good, I mean I don't think that they don't recognize it, but that smell definitely triggers a reaction. Just like a smell can trigger a memory for you, I think it does the same for elephants. Young, lots of young elephants here of course and you can see they're all pretty much normal coloured and an interesting question from Anna Marie in Northern California about albi albinism in elephants. It's a topic that comes up quite a lot in sorry Southern California and people seem to people seem to be fascinated by the concept of albinism and animals of different colours and it is interesting. Uh, Anna Marie as far as I know nothing in the wild has survived to adulthood. I have heard of records of albino elephants but I don't think they survive out here and you know you see them sitting in the sun there as a youngster in the sun just about all day long and I think that their skins would very quickly wither and they'd become very sick from being in so much sun and without any kind of protection against the sun. So yes it has happened. Do they survive to adulthood? No.
All right, I think that we're going to leave these elephants to their feeding. We'll press on and see what else we can see in just a little while. Interesting question from Ruth in Costa Rica. Ruth, while we drive sort of out of the sighting, I'm going to try and answer it for you. Um, I think if I've understood it correctly, you want to know about hydrophobia, which as far as I'm aware is the, the fear of water. Correct? Brian? Hydrophobia in elephants. Um, an elephant would die pretty quickly if it was afraid of water. Uh, certainly something that happens to people when we get rabies or oh, if you get rabies, uh, just prior to death, of course. Um, and I don't know of any records of elephants exhibiting any kind of hydrophobia. Um, perhaps, Ruth, if I'm not getting your question correctly, please feel free to send through another one, or to clarify, or maybe you've read something about it. In fact, I can't think of any animals out here. Brian, just quite, just, can you see the elephant? <laughs> There's an elephant hiding behind that quarry bush. And I nearly didn't see him, you know. Imagine if you were on foot. Imagine you were on foot, exactly. An elephant, if it hears you coming on foot, its first reaction will be to go dead silent. And if you weren't paying a lot of attention, that sort of four-ton young bull would have been lurking behind that worry bush until you almost stepped on his toe. Wonderful. So, I don't know of any other animals that become hydrophobic out here. Perhaps animals that are infected with rabies um, and not, are not just carriers. And I know a lot of the mongoose species can carry rabies, but don't necessarily exhibit symptoms. Um, I don't know if any of them become hydrophobic. I don't think so. I think out here, if you become hydrophobic, uh, death, <laughs> de death results fairly chop-chop. There's a much bigger bull there. Huge bull coming through here. Sorry, I'm just going to sneak a little bit forward for you, Brian. I don't so we can get a view. And of course, hydrophobia. I think elephants are quite the opposite of hydrophobic. They move massive, massive distances in order to get to water and certainly through the through the Kalahari and Botswana they migrate huge distances to get to the waters of the Okavango in order to drink during the wet season. So this, this isn't the big bull I was talking about, there's another one just behind but he's behind a, a bush so I'm not going to speed in there after him. What is he doing there? Let me just sneak a bit... Mm. Brian, I'll go back a bit. I think you might get a better view of him. Shout if you want me to stop. Beautiful big bull. Now, while on your screen he might not look any bigger than some of the others, I would say, compared to the bull that we saw first today, I'd say that animal is about a ton heavier. 
he's much taller and he's much more thickly set and you can see it's sticking out right in front of him And he's eating the red thorn tree that Brian and I sampled the other day. Very delicious underbark. I shall try and find some again, in fact. Very sweet tasting. Another one of the acacias that takes a hammering during the dry season. Mm. Lovely big elephant bull. Right, I think let us press on and see what other wonders await us here in the Kruger National Park. While we're driving away, a lovely question from Joanne in Iowa, where I don't believe elephants are particularly common. Um, Joanne, you want to know, have I seen incidences where injuries have resulted in death for elephants, um, such as perhaps the, the cutting over the trunk or some other kind of injury? Joanne, um, once or twice, but normally those injuries are inflicted by other elephants, um, and they'll be sort of fairly mortal straight away. So, if that bull, for example, has a fight with a youngster and spikes him with his tusks, death is going to come pretty quickly to the elephants. Um, but what normally happens, uh, what's, uh, if an animal is injured in the herd, and it is not a mortal wound, because it's such a strong herd and family structure, the herds will stick together and kind of look after the sick one until it gets better, or injured one until it gets better. So. It probably happens far less than it does, say, in a pride of lions, which tend to not look after each other at all. Quite an interesting one the other day that Brent and I were chatting about was an elephant at Londolozi, which is just down south of here, which was born deformed, with sort of back legs that bent the wrong way. The sort of hock joint seemed to be bent out the wrong way. She was, she was bow-legged, and she really struggled to move with the herd. And I think she was about, I think she was about six when it just became too much for her and she couldn't keep up anymore and the herd eventually gave up on, on having her with them. And she was eventually killed in a fairly horrific scene with, by about ten hyenas. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon for, or it's, it's not impossible for death to ensue from an injury or something like that, but it's not common. And we don't tend to really... We do quite a lot of naming of animals out here, of course, um, and you on the Twitterverse are particularly fond of doing that, um, and that's great because it does give us an idea of who's who and who's what. And a question coming through about whether we name the elephant herds. We don't, you know. Um, and I'll tell you why. It's because it's often quite difficult. Uh, with Taxon going down there, I think we're going to follow him for now. Um, we don't name them because they, they're not territorial. And they're also fairly fluid. So, um, you know, people, will, not people, elephants will join and leave and come in and come out so the size of the herd will vary quite a lot they'll disappear for months at a time and then come back and spend a few months in an area so it's difficult to know which elephant herd is which elephant herd so no often we don't name we don't name them So while we're discussing the names of animals, um, the 
the naming of leopards in the area. We've had a nice question from Gail and um, uh, Gail and in Amarillo, Texas. I'm not sure where that is actually. That sounds like quite an interesting place to be. Gail and Shelley, thank you for your question. Um, you want to know about the naming of leopards and why we name them and how we name them and is it registered and that sort of thing. It is absolutely registered. We do share the names between the different lodges and indeed with a, great, a huge organization called Panthera which does a huge amount of cat research and they use the names that we use and so there's a huge database of named leopards. It's not only sort of individual to reserves. So for example Karula who is our sort of Queen of Juma or star of our, our leopard show, she's known as Karula everywhere she's seen. And some, some places don't give them names. So where I used to work at Londolozi or Angala, we didn't used to name them uh, as such. But we did used to refer to them as either by the territory they lived in or by the spot pattern above the whiskers. So where my first, so my first sort of favorite leopards that we had was the Oppie female. And she was named after a dam around which her territory uh, her territory centered and so she was known as the oppie female and yeah I and mean, we had a couple called the fountains male and uh, so very yeah, very similar way of doing it just not sort of bob or jennifer which tends to be more the the um uh, the, the tradition up here in the north of the sabi sands and the naming of leopards of course happens the tradition is that the rain finds the leopard cub, should it survive to independence or just before independence, the ranger who found that cub will be allowed to name that cub. And so we've called, we on the, through Wild Earth have called Shadow's Cub Sindile, whereas everybody else in the reserve at the moment refers to that as Shadow's Cub. So they refer to Sindile as Shadow's Cub because he's not in independence yet and so we're not sure if he's going to survive. I think he's going to survive, but we're not 100% sure. And the ranger will, who found him, the chap called Sean, will be able to be in about six months. Be in about six months' time. And then I'm not sure if the Twitterverse will take to the new name. Maybe we'll just continue calling him Sindila, or maybe we'll we'll use the name of the rain. Everyone else will then start to call him by. Okay, we are going through a bad signal area. It will be bad until we get through the dip. We lose picture. Not sure why. Some beautiful trees there, and I've always wanted to stop and show you what we see in that drainage line. But alas, Wendy doesn't want that from us. and just give a little bit of a lay of the land. So off to the, down the road and up the other side there on that far crest, that is a sort of northeastern boundary. Um, and you can see that it's quite a lot higher up than most of the rest of the reserve. Down, and we're gonna basically drive to the top of that, check Buffelshook Dam, and then we're gonna head down south to the southeastern boundary. And you'll see that it's quite a lot lower at that area. But this general side of the reserve um, is pretty high up and we get a good view of the mountains when the sun starts to set. So just to give you an idea of the lay of the land of Juma and Vuyatela. See what else we can hear quickly. A couple of woodpeckers caught, um, chipping away at the wood, I probably can't hear them. Very, very, very gentle rustle of a few, very gentle rustle of a, the few last leaves of the winter. I tell you, if you ever get the chance and you perhaps, um, if you ever feel in the need to try and find yourself as we tend to, is the most amazing place to do it. To come and sit, there's a termite mound just over there, and to come and sit on a termite mound for a huge for an afternoon and be totally alone in the wilds like this for three hours totally on your own and listening to all the sounds smelling the different smells in a place as ancient as this it will 
unless you're an auto automaton, it will really touch something deep inside you. So I hope those of you who are watching here will eventually be able to experience something like that because this ancient land really does tend to, it gets into you and gives you a real sense of everything's okay. Not so, Brian? Mm -hmm. Yes. Brian, of course, is one of the most chilled out people I've ever met in my life, so I think that's probably partly due to the fact that he spent so much time in wild places. mentioning Karula. And Karula, for those of you who don't know, is a female leopard about 11 years old. She's a, um, well, I, I got into a lot of trouble once with saying she was a little bit pug-faced, uh, but that's not to take away from the fact that she's very beautiful. And a lot, we haven't seen her for a while. In fact, I've only ever seen her once. And she actually, I was worried about her myself until I heard a report on the radio this very morning to say that she has been found, in fact, sorry, I think it was yesterday, that she was found on Biffles Hook, which is just north of us here. And so she's alive and well and absolutely fine. And I think she was on a kill. So good news about Karula. She, the queen of Juma, she is just north of us here and she's absolutely 100% fine. Thank you, Dolly, from London, Ontario, Canada know there was a place called London in Canada. driving along and not seeing a great deal in the way of uh, exciting mammal life or bird life or fish life or reptile life or amphibian life uh, or indeed any great amount of life and Joanne you have asked a lovely question about the mass of different animals and I mentioned the mass of uh, a buffalo in comparison with a with an elephant today whoops sorry about that didn't hurt anyone's head and you want to know the difference between the mass of a rhino and a big buffalo. Well, a big buffalo weighs about 800 kilograms. I think the biggest ever buffalo weighed was about a ton, so a thousand kilograms. Now, a white rhino bull is more than twice that size. A white rhino bull is two and a half thousand kil kilograms or two and a half tons, so substantially bigger. But a black rhino um, is about a ton to 1.2 tons. So 1,200 kilograms. So a really huge buffalo bull and a really small ri a black rhino would be of similar size. There's an elephant. I had a feeling we'd see lots of elephants today. There's many elephants, in fact. Brian, let me get into this little clearing here. I don't think we're going to spend too long with them. We have had a lovely elephant sighting earlier. But as they say, Brian, what's the uh, cliche they use? Beggars can't be choosers. Yes. Well, quite, yes. <laughs> this little clearing, this. I suspect it's been cleared by termites and elephants. 
has been cleared by termites. This is quite interesting. Let's have a look at the elephants first, and then I'll show you what I mean about the termites. Little herd of elephants, probably about four of them. That's all I can see at the moment. Brian, you see any others? No, only four at the moment. It's two cows and two... Ooh, I don't know that I'm talking the truth here. That's quite interesting. I think this is a young bull in front of us. And there's a youngster there behind the bull, of course. And then a cow who's managed to get herself into a weeping wattle thicket and her calf trying to have a little bit of a suckle. Very nice question from the United Arab Emirates from a chap called Johan. Johan, from your name, I'm going to assume that you weren't born in the United Arab Emirates. I don't know that it's a traditional Arabic name, Johan. Um, and I'm going to assume that you're perhaps feeling a little homesick as you watch us. I hope not too badly so. And you ask a lovely question about tuskers. We were looking at that big bull earlier, and you wanted to know you say you can see the size of the elephants, but do we ever get any really big tuskers out here? Johan, there are a few left in the Kruger. There are not many of them. There are not many of them at all, but we do get a few. And the reason that there aren't many left, of course, is that they were all shot out. The genetic legacy of those big tuskers has been shot out by greedy short-sighted ivory hunters in the 19th century to the extent that when the Kruger National Park was proclaimed in 1926 there were eight elephants left in this entire area and when you consider that there are now 15,000 that is quite something eight elephants left in about three million hectares now that's not to say that the genetics for big tusks don't still exist and we certainly had, I think it was the Magnificent Seven, seven big elephant bulls in the Kruger National Park. But they, also, they don't seem to have spawned a whole generation of very large tuskers. And where their gen genes are, I'm not sure. They're no doubt around somewhere. But those seven bulls, I don't think any of them survive to this day. And so, yes, there may be big tuskers later on, but that's a lovely scene. Thank you so much for that. Young bull displaying great skill at watering some of the plants and fertilizing them at the same time. Excellent skill. Um, so, Johan, not big tuskers here. We do every so often get a big chap that comes through here, but it's very, very rare. Right, I think let's leave these fellows. Sorry, that is a cow, that's not a bull. You can see from the uh, rounded head, did you see that there, um, I Brian? Did. Thank you. Okay, good. Brian's becoming quite an expert. All right, Brian, sorry, I'm just going to ask you to have a quick look around here, if you don't mind. And I'm not going to get out of the car for fear of either frightening the elephants or being trampled to death on live television, neither of which are particularly preferable. Um, and if you look at the sort of bareness of the soil here, can you see that? And you look down here at this mound, just in front of us there, that's it, there. That mound there is a mound of a termite called Odontotermes. And Odontotermes likes to, they collect dry grass, take it down into their mounds. Well, I mean, a lot of the termites do this, but this one's particularly good at it. And I suspect that what you'll find is that this entire clearing that we happen to be sitting on here was created by termites. It's quite rocky, and so the grass probably doesn't grow here particularly easily. But I suspect that these termites and this mound extends 
a long way underground under here and that's where all the grass of this area has gone and that will be made even worse for the fact that the soil will be very nutritious because of the termites and so animals will come and actively select to graze and feed in this area. And the mound is a lot bigger than you can see it there. It definitely extends a long way underground. And there are a couple of them, a couple of little sort of chimney spots around this clearing. Just an interesting little uh, piece, titbit of information. Right. move out of this ele elephant sighting, Ocean, Oregon, uh, about, if you want to know about tunnel cameras and have we ever used a sort of spy cameras, and um, we haven't here because they're a little more difficult to send a signal out of, um, but I have seen footage, and I'm sure you have too, of, of um, sorry, a little bit of shouting on the radio there, I'm sure you've seen footage of those sort of spy cameras going down into termite mounds and into ant nests and that sort of thing. Um, and it is really fascinating to see what goes on in there. And in terms of hyena dens, we haven't done that. Um, but I have stuck my head into a hyena den that is, was inactive, just to see if it smelled really bad. And interestingly, it really didn't. Quite close to some elephants here. We'll just have a quick stop here by this cow. And then you genuinely can see that it's a cow from the very square forehead that she has. Chewing away on a piece of wood for supper. Mmm, delicious. I'm very glad every time we see an elephant chewing on a piece of wood. Oi! Every time I see them chewing on wood like this, I, I feel pleased for Manuel's cooking. Gave us a little bit of a head toss there. Sometimes you can also tell the gender, well you'll read that you can tell the gender of an elephant from the angle that the tusks are growing. He's really not very happy with us, this cow. Now, that is very strange. All the other elephants I've seen here since arriving have been totally confiding. She's definitely not happy. Anyway, we've had some very good elephant sightings today, so I think we'll leave her to her bad mood. So you can also apparently tell the sex of an elephant from the angle that the tusks grow. So the bulls on that big bull you saw they were out and facing like that and on the cows they tend to face further down. Um, I've seen bulls with tusks that face straight to the floor. Uh, you can tell when they're adults from the thickness though. Bulls tend to have much thicker tusks at the base and cows much thinner. But things like, um, things like the forest elephants, their bulls often have long sort of thin tusks so it's not a great indicator the best way is is from the, the forehead and obviously from the obvious which uh, two elephants very kindly showed us today talking about the, the Tuskers and uh, maybe I'm not sure if he's still around but Pamela makes mention of one of those magnificent seven bulls 
Uh, one of whom was called Chukudu, and I'm not sure what some of the others were, were called, except for the one that Pamela's just mentioned called Duke. And he apparently is one of the biggest tuskers that the Kruger Park's ever known. And I don't know where he is at the moment, um, or if he's still alive. I think he is still alive, but I'm not sure where he hangs out. So if anybody wants to find out where Duke is hanging around, perhaps Pamela, you can tell us. So we're now at the very northeastern corner of Juma. Heading down towards the southeast to see if anything's crossed over during the course of the day. The dogs didn't come across, I'm afraid. And just going back to the topic on the naming of animals, Rudy in California. Um, you want to know if there's some kind of database of names of everything that's been named at Wild Earth? Um, I actually don't know. If you want to know a database of uh, leopard names, there's a Facebook page for the, called the Sa Leopards of the Sabi Sands. So you can get an idea there of the leopards. Of all the other animals, I'm not sure. I think there's also a Facebook page, Lions of the Sabi Sands. But perhaps one of our viewers can let us know if there's a Wild Earth specific area um, or Wild Earth specific site where we can get the names. So, one interesting question from James in Kansas on the naming. And it opens up a very interesting discussion. And I'm just going to stop next to this termite mound. We have looked at it before, but we're going to do it again. And while I answer this question from James in Kansas, you spoke, you speak about whether the naming right falls to the tracker or to the ranger. Now, I'll get to your question now, James. Um, in fact, I'll answer it now, and then I'll, we'll go and have a look at the termite mound because we were just talking about spy cameras and that sort of thing and, and using them to look inside termite mounds and you get quite a nice view inside that termite mound. James, and for those of you who don't know, a lot of the lodges here have got uh, a ranger and a tracker who will take guests out and on a safari and show them around the place. Now the tracker, certainly where I used to work, makes a huge amount of difference to the safari. Often he's paired with someone like me and in the year 2000 I was a clueless young buck from the city who knew absolutely nothing about the bush and on the front of the vehicle sat 120 kilograms of Shangan tracker called Elvis Ngomane and Elvis Ngomane got me and my guests out of any number of sticky situations that I would probably have um, well there certainly would have been a lot closer calls without his help he taught me more about the bush than sort of any any book did or any trainer I ever had did so the tracker out here plays an enormous role in the safari. Some places don't have trackers. I know Cheetah Plains doesn't use trackers. I don't think Mala Mala does anymore. I personally think that reduces the experience because trackers are repositories of amazing knowledge if you get to know them, which is fantastic. And so James, you ask, does the tracker get also to name the, name the, the leopard that's just been found or is it only the ranger? I don't know exactly. I'm pretty sure though that the tracker and the ranger get to name the leopard uh, together and especially if the track is founded on foot alone I'm sure the tracker has an enormous say in whether they what they name it so it, any any ranger who thinks that he's operating out here alone and he's the big hero on the back of this vehicle with his big Land Rover and his big gun if he thinks that he's the the real sort of hero out here he's normally doesn't last very long and ends up back in the city as an accountant those who develop a genuine trust and respect with their tracker uh, tend to end up out here for much longer because they just learn so much more and it becomes such a, such a rewarding experience, far more rewarding than it would be otherwise. 
Right, we're just going to have a quick look at this termite mound. And Brian, it'll be difficult in the light, won't it? Well, that should be good. You're right. So this is a different kind of termite from the one we looked at before. This is mac this is not uh, sorry this is Macrotermes natalensis, the fungus growing termite and no black mambas living inside thankfully. But you can just see perhaps some of the tunneling that goes on in here and it is highly extensive. The workers and soldiers bustling about on it when it was active. But this has been excavated by an art park and it is now no longer functioning. But it is a little burrow for lots of different kinds of creatures that like to live in the safety and warmth, very insulated environment of, an art, of, a, of a termite mound. And Macrotermes natalensis, the fungus growing termite. Fungus, they grow big gardens of fungus under the ground. I think there's some ant species in South America that do the same thing. And they do that because they don't have the enzymes that they need to digest cellulose and cellulose is the structural sort of substance that makes that gives plants their structure otherwise they'd just be amorphous jellies a bit like jellyfish who don't have cellulose in them and we have skeletons um, insects have exoskeletons and plants have the cellulose in every single cell and that's what gives them their structural sort of um, abilities so the grass stalks are made largely of lignin and cellulose and that's what is digested by the fungus that the macrotermes grow. It's quite an amazing sort of feat of gardening and farming that they go through. Brian, this pile of pillows is becoming irksome to me. I think somebody must design me a cushion, a special one. Right, on we go. that all the other game drives have either gone north or east of us uh, to various different sightings of things. Uh, we are alone on Juma, which we kind of knew anyway, but we have the whole expanse to explore on our own, which is marvellous. do is head off towards Biffles Hook Dam and see if there isn't anything coming down to drink and we have had an update we have had an update from Arethusa where they don't seem to be I thought maybe the apparently the Matimbas and the Sticks Pride had been found there but there's no mention of them there now so alas they don't seem to be around. Not sure where that information came from. They may have moved off. Apparently that info came from Facebook, but nobody seems to be looking at them now. It's a pity, but we will keep our ear to the ground. Brian and I had a massive herd of buffalo around here two days ago. They are obviously not here now. They've headed off north into Biffles Hook as well. <laughs> Lovely question from Kay in Wisconsin. Kay, thank you for your question. You want to know about that Iconic species of Africa, the dung beetle. The dung beetles, we do get lots of them here, okay? 
And you know there are over 700 species of dung beetle. Uh, we don't get all of them here, we get lots of them, but not in the winter time. So what happens with a dung beetle is that it will go, I mean there are lots of different kinds, so I'll go with the, the most famous one which of course is the um, dung ball rolling species. And what they do is they roll a ball of dung, uh, the female does, no the male does first, and this is called the nuptial ball. And he rolls off and if he's created a dung ball of sufficient magnificence, he will attract a female dung beetle and they, after an extensive period of mating, will sup on the dung from this nuptial ball, uh, which sounds like a totally horrific habit to me, but that's apparently what does it for them. And then she will go off, and she will go off and Sorry, excuse me, I just had a bit of a radio explosion there. I lost my train of thought. So what she will do is go off and um, build her own ball and lay an egg right in the middle of it and then bury it. And that egg will then hatch probably somewhere around now and the little larva will eat away the dung that's underground but only when the rains come and softens the ground will the dung beetles then emerge from the ground and start buzzing around the place eating dung. And that's basically why we don't see any of them in the winter time at all. On the subject of insects, dung beetles are of course insects. Blair in British Columbia, you've got a question about army ants. And it's generally, this is quite, funnily enough, quite a common query we get from people who come out here. You know, are there any, any danger from ants? And I think it's probably from watching documentaries on South America. We don't get anything quite as vicious as the army ants that you, they find in South America. We do get biting red ants, which is not very pleasant. And Brian, have you ever been bitten by a red ant? I have indeed. It's not a very pleasant experience, is it? It's not great. No, not great. But it's certainly not deathly. Brian is still with us, with all, all four limbs intact. So we do get the odd biting ant. Some are fairly vicious biting ones, like the Matabele ant, which uh, they do tend to go through an area and create havoc with things that aren't, say, with termite mounds and that sort of thing. They raid termite mounds and steal baby termites and eat their eggs but we don't tend to have a major issue with people. So no army ants as such here, Blair. Here we are at Buffel's Hook Waterhole. It doesn't seem to have attracted a great deal of thirsty animals. Although there are elephant tracks here. We'll just have a quick listen and look. And for those of you who perhaps have just joined us, or maybe you're a first time viewer, for many weeks there was a single hippo bull in here. I suspect a young bull who had been tossed out of his natal pod by the dominant bull and he unfortunately has pressed on and then he was joined briefly by um, <laughs> a hippo cow and we had a whole storyline going about the romance of Bob the bachelor of Buffel's Hook and his uh, and his his erstwhile lover, Princess Daisy. Unfortunately, that romance seems to have come to a sticky end, and they are they are no longer with us here at Buffalo's Hook. This waterhole is pretty deep. I was thinking about trying to walk across it the other day, but I decided against it, especially when Brent Leo Smith told me one day that he had uh, seen a crocodile in here. Now. There isn't a crocodile in here now, as far as I know. But crocodiles can move astonishing distances, up to sort of 50 kilometers, apparently, in a night. And so you just never know. And you don't want to be halfway across a dam like this when those two little eyes pop out not too far from you. I find crocodiles probably the animal that I'm most afraid of out here. And that's because they evolved before people, so they see us completely as fair game. They are, don't 
see us as any different from any other kind of prey animal that they, that they might encounter. Not really afraid of us at all. Right, not much going on here. We'd best press on. That noise you can hear is not me blowing my nose. It is Brian just cleaning bits of dust off the camera. That would normally happen, of course, when we're off air. But as we only have one car out here now, you're getting to see us warts and all, as they say. You don't have many warts there, do you, Brian? No. No. Not at all, actually. No. Lucky old you. I used to have an enormous wart on my right big toe, Brian. It was very disgusting. Another lovely insect question about termites and how long they take to build. And that's from Robert in Michigan. Robert, um, it's not easy to say. And I'll tell you why it's not easy to say, because sometimes these mounds are not continuously occupied. So they can be occupied, then they go dormant. Then another pair of king and queen perhaps land there and start another uh, colony in it because it's already kind of half built. And the fungus gardens are perhaps already in existence. So it's difficult to say exactly. But they reckon that a brand new termite mound for about a soccer ball, they can grow about a soccer ball every, I think it's every few months. So soccer ball size every few months. So some of these mounds are possibly, possibly hundreds of years old, which is amazing. Now, what does happen is that a termite mound is, I'll tell you how it all begins, it's quite an interesting process and it's actually one of my favorite times of year when the flying termites come out of the mounds because it's sort of a culmination of such an enormous amount of effort that the termites put into life and it's a kind of real, I don't know, it's sort of a celebratory time uh, not always for the termites because they tend to get eaten by the, by the thousand on the day that they come out of the mounds but I really find it a, an exuberant and sort of and cheering day when they come out of the mounds. So what happens is that they'll come out and a male and a female will find each other, so they're all either male or female, will find each other, shed their wings and the male attracts the female by exuding a pheromone and flapping his wings and sending it out into the air and she will find him and then they will both shed their wings and they'll mate once and then dig a little hole and this is why it happens in the rain because the ground must be soft so that they can dig a little hole and she will almost immediately start laying eggs and he will build the royal chamber around which in which she will live and she'll also start to grow and over the next the course of the next little while she'll give birth to both male and female workers and soldiers of to the different castes of termite and they will start to build around her and over the course of the next little while, she will grow to about that big. Her abdomen will be that size. And it's a white, pulsating sausage that produces up to, how many eggs a day? 20,000 eggs a day. She will pop out of this enormous white sausage factory of eggs. And so you can see very quickly at its height, a termite mound is producing lots and lots and lots of workers and lots of soldiers and I'll tell you how that she knows which to lay now um, and all of them are building the mound around her and she can apparently live for up to 15 years and the male just sits around her and he eats a bit from the workers then he mates a bit with her then he has a snooze then he eats a bit and then he mates a bit and so it's quite a nice life being a king termite uh, if you don't mind living underground in a small hole so you can see how many termites will start to build an enormous mound. Yeah, some people will tell you thousands of years. I don't believe it takes anything like that long. But I do think some of the big ones are probably up to 100 years old. So Robert, I hope that gives you some sort of idea. And then I've always been fascinated about how or why she knows whether to lay 
worker termites or soldier termites. And she knows because every time a termite goes past another termite, and you must do, you must watch this. And um, if you can find a documentary on termites, it's interesting to see. They exchange a little bit of saliva. So of course the ratio of soldier saliva to worker saliva is almost universal throughout the mouth. And there's a certain amount of hormonal and pheromonal interaction. Look at that little squirrel. There's there. Don't move. Sorry, it's moved into the thick stuff. There you can see him knocking about there. There we go. Brent and I watched a tree squirrel being chased by a slender mongoose this morning while we were trying to track a leopard. Fascinating to see. They leapt out of a tree from about five meters, ran along the ground, and eventually the mongoose gave up when the squirrel shot up another tree. I'll just quickly finish my termite discussion. So there's a certain ratio of worker to soldier saliva in all the termites in the mound because they go past each other and they exchange saliva. So whoever feeds the queen, whichever worker takes her her food, will have that ratio of worker to soldier saliva in its mouth and she or he worker gives the food to the female and so transfers that ratio to her and that creates a reaction in her body that allows her to either lay soldier eggs or worker eggs or alates which will become the new breeding termites so it's really an astonishing um, way that she's able to manipulate the the ratio of different castes within a termite mound fascinating brian mm. yes good Again, another insect question, very nice one. Ocean from Oregon. Can you see the ocean from Oregon? I'm not sure if you can. Um, you want to know, we get bees out here. Absolutely, we get bees, and we do get beehives, and they sit in the trees um, sometimes, the, the swarms, but less and less. You know, as, as with everywhere else in the world, it seems that bees are under threat. But yes, we do get swarms that come through here from time to time. Mm, I don't find them very often, but yes, we absolutely do. Just to wrap up our creepy crawly conversation, or bug conversation, as is probably the term many people would use, what makes me the most squeamish out here? Uh, Brian, is there something that makes you squeamish out here insect wise? Insect wise, not really. Not really. Spiders, something Spiders, spider. okay. <laughs> I think that's a good one. That's probably for most people, I suspect, that that spiders probably make them the most squeamish. Now, certainly in summer when the great golden orbweb spiders string their webs across the road and we drive into them and they land in the vehicle, sometimes in the mouth and the eyes everywhere, but they don't bite at all, but they do make people leap up and down as though they've been shocked by a plug socket. Um, Ashley, for me, I used to be quite squeamish when I first came out here, you know, I was from the city and so I didn't know much about insects and every so often the spiders used to make me a bit jumpy and that sort of thing, but no, I don't think anything insect-wise makes me that squeamish. That said, just up north of here where you get Mapani trees, um, the Mapani worm, which is a caterpillar, uh, provides a very important source of protein to local people uh, and I've eaten dried worms, which don't taste too bad, but there are some people that will eat them fresh. So you pluck the worm off the tree, hold it by the head, squeeze its guts out, 
pop it in the mouth. That would make me gag. In fact, Brian is now pulling a horrible face. So yes, that would make me squeamish, Ashley, and I don't think that I would try it. do now, not, not a huge amount of action going on here, let's just head up onto High Point and I'll show you the mountains before we head down into the drainage line areas. butterfly of that uh, fairly gruesome emperor caterpillar that I've just described is it was not a butterfly it's a moth and it's called an emperor moth Brian Crested Franklin on the road it's not particularly exciting everybody I'm just uh, I'm just quite excited to see something that is uh, not stationary. So why don't we look at those crested Franklin, which are looking for the creepy crawlies we've been discussing. Uh, they are basically fossicking about in some dung, hoping to find remnants of winter insects that have chosen to eat in the dung. Um, and I was just talking about the beautiful emperor moth it comes out of the Mapani caterpillar and it's a beautiful sort of pinkish brownish color and we also get something called a moon moth in the springtime and they almost don't look real they're sort of greenish colored and we've had a question about whether we'll see them or not from Sharon in Kansas City and Sharon Yes, we do see them here. They are absolutely real. They're not very common though, you know. We don't see them very often. But there are different, and I think there are a few different species of lunar moth that we find. In fact, while you look at those franctums, I'll just look at my insect book and see if I can't find a picture of one of you. So that you're not left completely in the dark. Those crested franklins are the most common franklins that we find out here. Franklin being a ground-dwelling bird. Moth 314. I have found the moths, everyone. Fear not. Whether any one of them will be moon moths, I cannot be sure. something called a snot moth which doesn't sound very pleasant right here we go number four beautiful Brian if you don't mind coming this away right so here are the sort of emperor moths, one of which is the lunar moth, and that's that one there. That is the lunar moth. And we do see them every so often around here. And hopefully we will see some this spring. And you can see lots of different emperor moths. The Mapani moth looks a little bit like these ones here. That sort of thing. That's called a wattle emperor at the moment. Well, forever. But it's not. I'm just going to quickly see if I can find you a Mapani moth. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there he is. That's a Mapani moth up there. That's what the Mapani moth looks like. And that is only if it doesn't become eaten. And that, everybody, is the infamous or famous Mapani worm that will turn into that once it's eaten lots of Mapani trees. And that is an edible thing? Would you eat that, Louise? 
Definitely not. Mm-hmm. Brian, have you ever eaten one? Mm-mm. Not delicious. A bit like sort of um, gamey sawdust when dry, and when wet, I can only imagine the. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we'll just leave it there. And that's not to take away how important they are, because so often you hear people talk about. Um, things that people eat out here as being an African delicacy. No, they're not an African delicacy, they're a necessity for survival most of the time. Um, Cooking in Africa has never been a particularly sophisticated thing out down here and that is simply because of the lack of ingredients of indigenous plants that can be domesticated and indigenous spices and herbs. So people have definitely made amazing uh, recipes with what they have to make do with here but people often come out here and they say can we have some traditional South African cuisine um, from a, a European point of view so I mean the two groups of white South Africans the the Afrikaners have managed to produce the rusk which I've gone into lengthy discussions of before which is basically stale bread uh, burrovos which is a delicious kind of sausage um, and that's about all uh, oh beef jerky based biltong which is in most parts of the world is considered a survival ration as opposed to a delicacy. So same thing, they were the early sort of white settlers that came up into this area and then the local indigenous people, you know, they were eating game when they could get it uh, but you need to eat obviously different kinds of foods. Um, not a huge amount of flavor in the plants here and the, there's no real huge amount of edible herbs and spices. So food tends to be traditional food out here tends to be fairly bland compared with the uh, flavoursome things of North Africa for example where the Moroccans used a lot of curries and chilies and that sort of thing and even the Arab influenced foods along the east coast of Africa. So when people come out here and say can we eat something traditional um, I normally say uh, you can I'm not sure you'll want to once I tell you what it is though. Another question from from London, Ontario, Canada, not England. And Dolly, you say to me, I hadn't heard of your town before, but you say it's quite a big one of 300,000 people. That's fairly large. Uh, certainly bigger than Hootspreit, which is just near here. A fairly dubious settlement, just in the base of the mountains. Um, and Dolly, you also ask about mosquitoes and what we do to prevent being bitten by them. Well, of course, in winter time, uh, notice how cold it is in winter time here. I'm wearing my shirt sleeves and shorts. Um, in winter time, they're not around, so we don't tend to worry about them too much. In summertime, they are an issue for some people, and obviously, this is a malaria area, which means I always struggle to say malaria area in the win in the in the morning, uh, but in the evening, I can say malaria area many times very quickly. And it's a mild malaria area which basically means that it's unlikely that you get it coming into this area but it's possible and some people take a lot of precautions I personally don't do a huge Brian there's a fish eagle coming over the top there you may just pick him up as he goes over the knob thorn tree beautiful fish eagle Wonderful. So that was a fish eagle. Um, just getting back to the mosquito thing. Um, I luckily don't seem to be bitten. They don't like me or my father. Uh, my sister and brother and mother get absolutely eaten to pieces. Do you get eaten? Brian gets absolutely eaten ravaged. to pieces too. Ravaged. They ravage him. Uh, I'm not sure I'd like to be ravaged by a mosquito. Um, but, so, I mean, what precautions do you take? 
mosquito net and mosquito repellent. Okay. So you can't take uh, malaria, anti-malarials if you live in a, in a malaria area because they eventually start to poison you. Um, so you just got to take precautions. So Brian uses a mosquito net. He'll use mosquito repellent when we come out on drive. He might wear long pants during the, the evenings and that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean the best, the best thing to do is not get bitten. And that's by using repellents and long clothes and that sort of thing. A dolly is certainly not nearly as bad as it can be further north in parts of Mozambique and Zambia. I think Brent's had malaria something like 28 times. So, I mean, that probably explains quite a lot. But never once from here. He's had it 28 times, but never once from this area. And he's been working out here for a long time. get a little update I have heard of a lion kill it's definitely not on Juma so we definitely can't go there but what I'm gonna do is just get a quick update on it and find out who it is so that I can just tell you exactly who's doing what and where Tom come in Tom Craig do you copy Craig Good afternoon, Craig. Can you go with the position of that kill and who made it? Okay, copy. Thanks very much. Um, so everybody that was the it's actually the buffalo kill that unfortunately saw the demise of one of the Inkuhuma lionesses the other day and there are four male lions there um, we can't go there they're in Torchwood you went there with Brent yesterday luckily but I'm afraid we can't go there at the moment it's a bit sad I'm going to stop here and just give you a quick talk um, on what exactly what's going on with some of the lions. Gail and Pamela and a few others have made mention of not knowing exactly what's happened uh, with some of the lions. And I keep making mention of the Birmingham lions. Is this a horrific position for you? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I've positioned myself right in the face of the sun. Uh, let me try and not be awkward about this. Okay, so, is that all right? There we go. Just so you can get a slightly different picture of me. Three hours of my, my face must be becoming quite tiring, I would imagine. So, Gail and Pamela and a whole lot of others, let me tell you what's happened with the lions, give you a bit of a recap. I'll try and give you some reasons as to why I think it's happened, but it's, it's really quite a difficult one to explain. So, just east of us here is a little reserve called Torchwood, very beautiful. And the Nkahuma pride, which used to be five female lions, female lions, five lionesses and two sub-adult lionesses, and one young male, they killed a buffalo there the other day. And as they were killing it, the five Birmingham males, and they're five young males, pushing now, I think, almost five years each, came in, finished the buffalo off, chased the pride off, and then the pride came back. And they tried to take the buffalo back from those five males, which totally instinctual I'm sure I'm sure there wasn't a huge amount of thought that went into it but what it meant was that they got into a physical fight with five males had had their blood up after the kill so that they were you know they were probably fairly full of adrenaline and full of I think get had had their blood up is a really nice way of describing it and in the course of that challenge one of the females from the Nkuhuma pride was killed now We've had lots of questions about why it is that these males would have killed a female. And I can only say I don't know. The Mapojo 
male coalition, which was another five males that came into the area, originally six, came into the area about, mm, they were, came in about six or seven years ago. When they came in, they killed, I think, more than 20 lionesses around here and into the Timbavati and in the Manileti. Totally abhorrent behavior. They then came to dominate the area for no longer than anyone else did. So although they were quite a lot more vicious than some of the others, they didn't dominate for any longer than some of the other coalitions have. So I can't really tell you why, but I do think that this lioness was killed because of the fight over the food. I don't think she was killed in the same way that those Mapokos just went around murdering anything they could find. I think it was probably in the course of a fight over food and as you've all seen on some documentaries and perhaps even on Wild Earth, lions are horrific around a kill. They don't share anything with each other, they fight with each other and if you're a young lion you just stay out of the way and hope you get the scraps. So I think that's what happened. Um, we don't know what's going to happen now. The Matimba males were found apparently with a stick pr sticks pride not far from here, not on this reserve again. So they are around and the Matimbas, for those who don't know, are the resident dominant coalition of two males. They also started off as five and three of them went off to the north and two of them are here. And so a coalition of five males will probably not last like that, but they may take over a couple of territories as a coalition of five. Um, their days are looking pretty numbered. I'm still hoping they're going to give a walloping to one or two of these young bucks from the Birmingham boys, but whether that happens or not, I'm not sure. Days are numbered, and there are some young cubs with a Styx pride, so whether those are going to survive or not, I don't know. And also, one of the other Styx females was mating recently with a Matimba male, and whether those cubs will survive, it remains to be seen. So that's the story of the lions. Uh, very great upheaval, and I all think that it's going to all center on Juma here, but all the action seems to be having just east, just south, just north of us. So maybe, eventually, the great showdown will happen here at Juma, and that would be marvelous. Would it not, Brian? Yeah, exactly. Right. Let me get back into my cockpit, which is smaller than that of a Formula One car now, with all these cushions and things. Right, there we go. Sun's starting to set. It's very yellow today, it's not very gold, which is quite unusual because I don't see a huge amount. I mean, uh, there, there is a huge amount of shade. Not shade, what's that stuff called, Brian? Dust. And uh, smoke in the, air, in the air at the moment. So I'm not sure why it's quite so yellow. I think it's gonna go gold pretty soon. That's Brian's finger, everybody. You don't normally see that much of Brian. Uh, he's just wiping some dust off the lens at the moment. Again, would be done normally while you were staring at something exciting with another guide. But we have to do it all with you live today. All our warts, as I say. Not that Brian has any. Now just around here, there they are, I've been seeing two batalia, and I think they have a little nest, or they're about to have a nest, maybe they're courting for the spring, there's one there, I think they're going to create a nest here if they haven't already, you see that there Brian, I'll try and get you into a position where you can actually take a picture of it. You see the other one anyway. Can't be there. Try and get your position. Oh dear. Right, everybody, I'm afraid you're going to have to take my word for it. He's quite far off the road. But there is a battalier there, and there are a pair of them that hang around on this road seemingly every day either on that a dead tree to my right, just under the sun there, or to my left, in a little clump of knob thorn trees. Beautiful bird, one of my favorites.
see that I've kicked my communications out so that the sweet and sultry tones of Tara Dales are no longer reaching my ears. There we go. She's back in. Thank you for your comment, Tom in Oregon. Tom, I wonder if you live any close to Ocean who lives in Oregon. Tom, you say that before I got here in February, the Taxon and Aubrey who work for Vuyatella and Galago, which are just near here, you say that they came across the Birmingham males with another Nkahuma lioness that they killed. So apparently they, they do do that, which is uh, unfortunate. But thank you very much for that. It's fairly abhorrent behavior, I think, but maybe it happens more often than we think it does. The question as to why it happens, I really don't know. I can't answer. Anybody out there with an idea, please send it through. interesting one on Twitter just going on to the lions and why they these males are perhaps killing the females woman on Twitter you say were they perhaps trying to leave a message for the Matimbas by killing the female um, no I would say not woman we do we do do quite a lot of anthropomorphizing and that means to put a put a put our human impression or human emotions into animals um, and that's a bit too mafia for me. I don't think it's likely that the um, that, that, that that's why they would have killed a female. They wanted to send a message to the Matimbas, they'd just go and beat them up themselves. Um, and Diane, I think your postulation that perhaps she was trying to protect one of the sub-adults is quite a good one. I think that's exactly what happened. And then from Reading in England, someone called Wild Dog Pup, clearly not your birth name, but a very nice Twitter handle. Um, you want to know, do the lions in a pride have specific roles around a hunt? So, you know, does one, does one do something and one do the other, and one grab the tail, one trip it up, one grab the throat to suffocate it, and you say you saw them trying to take down, the Nkuhumas trying to take down a buffalo, and you notice that none of them went for the throat or went for the muzzle perhaps to suffocate the buffalo and you wondered if the Kahuma pride that was or lioness that was killed in February wasn't perhaps the sort of specialist suffocator no um, wild dog pup I don't think that that's the case I think individual lion prides will specialize on different animals I'm not going to speak now until we've gone through this dip hold that thought
that um, black screen and jumping in and out. Um, difficult enough to do for three hours when the signal is fine. Um, so back to the wild dog pup and the Ngurumas and whether one of them is perhaps a specialist. Right, now I think we're good to go. Um, so, li individual lion prides will specialize on different prey. The Kahumas, and contrary to what I thought when I first arrived here, it seemed to be pretty good at killing buffalo. And they've certainly eaten the hippo. I think they killed the hippo too. And perhaps some giraffe, I think they've killed as well. Um, but I don't think that there's a necessarily a specialization amongst the uh, amongst the, the lionesses that is as specific as one of them will be the specialist strangler one of them will do this and one of them will do that and that's because you know these kills happen in such an un unpredictable way that whoever gets on to whichever part of the buffalo will try and do do that first I've seen them I've seen lions eat a buffalo alive um, until it died and so you know no one bothered to try and strangle it I know, so I don't think there's that level of specialization. Sorry it took a while to answer that wild dog pup, but we did have a little bit of a problem with the signal. reiterate uh, the lioness that was killed by the by the Birmingham boys two days ago was an adult lioness from the Inkahuma pride I don't know Kathy and Thomas you want to know was it the orange-eyed female with whom I have a or for whom I have a particular soft spot I don't know I'm not sure no one was able to tell and of course by the time she was found her eyes were well shut so I'm afraid I don't know if it was her or not but I guess time will tell as soon as we see them again um, we'll be able to tell if the orange-eyed lioness is missing well, we're just heading towards twin dams not twin dams no signal there towards treehouse dam and hoping that there'll be some kind of mammal life there There is some mammal life there, but it's human. Good afternoon. Uh, how are you? Uh, we're fairly mammal free, but otherwise we're okay. How are you? Very quiet. This morning was very busy. Yes. You had the dogs this morning, did you? Dogs and we had Karula there, Tarde Quill. Yeah, super. Yes, right. Very nice. We've had uh, three crested Franklins this afternoon. <laughs> what happened there? Oh, that's a long story that I'll have to tell you over a. Uh, perhaps around the fire one day. It was an elephant that put its tusks in there. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, not me. Yeah. Yes, we are too. All right. Have a good afternoon. There were some elephants around too, but I, you know, yeah. No, nothing. Thanks, eh? So that was one of the landowners. Please excuse me. Well, I mean, it's a bit late for me to say please excuse me, but thank you for excusing me. Um, let me just pop across this wall. So, 
a lovely question from Anouk in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And Anouk, you say that you are wheelchair bound and you say animals do react to you differently. Um, and it obviously brings up a whole discussion about how animals react to us, especially because our bipedalism makes us much more of a threat to animals than look at that little steenbok eating stones that is interesting so a nuke well we're just going to zoom in on this little steenbok it seems to be eating stones or dung both of which are likely or perhaps eating some leaves off a broken twig. No, I think it's definitely the dung. You know what? I think it's eating buffalo dung that's been broken up. That's because it's still quite rich in energy. There'll be bacteria in it that the steenbok can use in its gut. And obviously a steenbok is a, well perhaps not obviously, but a steenbok is a concentrate feeder and needs a huge amount of energy to survive. So Anouk, while we look at the steenbok, um, and perhaps for everybody else who perhaps is a little uh, unclear about this. We are the apex predator out here. Everything sees us like that. In the vehicles, they don't though. They don't perceive us as the same threat because we are not standing up. Now often you will notice if you watch us drive into a lion sighting or a leopard sighting, even an elephant sighting, it's more difficult to see where they're looking. The first thing that gets looked at by a predator is, Brian, Sorry, it's you, Brian. That's what they start to look at. So they look at the cameraman on the back because they stick out more, and so they look more obvious. Now, if you stand up on the back of a vehicle, often an animal will react in an adverse way uh, by running away. And that's because they perceive our upright st uh, stature as being a threat. So, Anouk, you in your wheelchair, I haven't had any experience of taking people on foot in wheelchairs around here because that would be dangerous. The roads are obviously pretty rough and if we're walking off road here uh, I think a wheelchair would have a real tough time in reacting at the speed that we'd need to if say I said right we have to get behind that termite mound quickly there could be logs and all sorts of things in the way that said I have taken many people in wheelchairs on safari um, and so it's a great I mean certainly there's no reason that someone in a wheelchair shouldn't be on a safari but I think that in a wheelchair, a wild animal, it's difficult to say how they'd react. I think they'd probably react quite differently to when you were on foot. I think they'd probably be far more likely to investigate you than they would if you were standing upright. I hope that answers your question. So as the, everything dries out, you can see that Steenbok is having to eat quite a lot in the way of mm, perhaps slightly distasteful things. They will also eat stones and soil, especially at this time of year, because the stones and the, well, the soil has got quite a lot of salt content in it. That's a really nice picture. You can see how well disguised that little steenbok U is. I'll just have a quick listen. The sun is about to pop over the horizon. It has from this low angle. But we'll pull out onto the ridge crest and get a final view of it going down. Just some doves calling. That's all I can hear. And the odd robin in the distance and a long-tailed shrike. But you won't hear them. They're very far away. Right. From that dung-eating steenbok, let's go and see the sun go down. Have you ever seen that before? I haven't seen it either.
And my plan from here, in the absence of any kind of followable cat track or dog track, is we're going to pop up here and have a look down at the sun, hopefully just peeping down over the Drakensberg escarpment. And then we're going to head towards a, an old hyena den and just see if those hyenas that Jamie found this morning have not recolonized that den. Um, I did see it being investigated the other day, so they might have done that. I think we're going to be too late for the sun, Brian. Shall I drive at a great speed? Sharp drongo, that's it. The point at which I'm rushing, or to which I'm rushing, uh, is one of my favorite points on the reserve. There's the landowner, now eating quite a lot of dust. Sorry about that. Oh well. We have a wonderful saying in South Africa that goes, uh, sorry for you. It's when we're not feeling that sympathetic. As you maybe heard there, um, the landowner there, Jos, who comes from Biffleshoek, as you, as you maybe heard, he, they were with the wild dogs this morning and also saw Karula. So there were some questions about her whereabouts and her well-being, absolutely fine, doing well, unfortunately, on Biffleshoek and not on Juma. Sessie McGee, I think that's how we say your name, or McGee perhaps, Sessie, McGee or McGee. Um, you say, if I made a wild dog call, would it perhaps attract them? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think I can do it accurately enough. Somebody who might be able to do it more accurately, mm, perhaps. They've got very sharp ears, and a lot of what we don't hear, you know, there's a lot of tonality and frequency in their calls that we don't hear. And so I don't think there'd be people that would be able to call wild dogs. A greater chance you'd have if you made the distress call of an animal being killed. Um, that does tend to bring in predators if you happen to be around them. A number of very uh, valid questions around the ethics of doing that sort of thing. So uh, we heard the wild dogs calling today, um, Brent and I, when we were trying, hoping that they were going to come the side and so we could call Jamie in this morning. And they go, woo, woo. How was that, Brian? Good. Okay, good. Um, and it, it's amazing, the e echoes out through the trees. And you can hear it from miles. It sort of bounces off non-existent um, surfaces and echoes. It travels for miles. And then they'll also make a kind of a, if they're startled, they'll make a sort of bark. And it's just like a normal domestic dog bark, but they only do it once. They go, and then they stop. And they also, when they're near each other, will twitter. They make very loud twittering, oh look at that, that's pretty. Twittering bird-like noises when they're excited or on a kill or something like that. Brian, is this any good? Shall we go down? No, we're not going down there. There are people in having a drink. I'll just go a little bit further around here and you can have a look at the magnificent orange horizon. Which is being hidden by trees at the moment. There we go, that'll give you an idea of it. There we go, isn't that pretty? Um, and then the hyenas, of course, make very different sounds. Um, but maybe to the uninitiated, they might sound the same. So a hyena, if it's um, making a, a sort of territorial whoop, or trying to attract its mates, it is, it's not quite the whoop, whoop of the wild dogs. It's more a whoop. And those people behind us having their sundown was going to be shocked by what they're hearing. Anyway, but that's what a hyena does. 
They also will cackle though and giggle if they're excited. Um, and I suppose it does sound relatively similar to a wild dog, but they are completely unrelated animals. And so the sound is normally made for different purposes. Beautiful. Mm, volcanic sky. And you can see the smoke there. There's lots of smoke in the sky now. And that's from the cooking fires of the villages just outside here in the Bushbuck Ridge region. That's what this area is called outside the reserve. And also probably from a number of bushfires. People will now start to burn the old dry moribund grass off their grazing lands. I think it's a very bad idea in a year like this because as we had pointed out by Raisa, uh, it's predicted to be a very dry year and what you don't want to be doing is burning off moribund material on a dry year like this because if it doesn't grow back you then create a huge erosion risk. Lovely smell in the air, slight smoke. Mm, really nice. Bit of dust. Um, last time I stopped to smell something, there was a very strong smell of vanilla. I was looking around trying to find out where the smell of vanilla was coming from and then I noticed Andrew, who was, he'd locked the camera off on me and he was looking off at the horizon, covering his lips with a very strong smelling vanilla lip ice. Um, so that's where the vanilla smell came from. I've made him throw it away. See, well, this area has seen a fair amount of tragedy in the last little while. Um, the other day, some of you may have seen it and some of you may have not, but Viam and I were on foot around here. We were trying to track stuff. Um, and Viam and I were just walking through here. And Viam, for those of you who don't know, is a, a fine cameraman, one of our fine crew of four cameramen. And we watched a zebra stallion kill a foal, which was very traumatic. It left us really quite traumatized. Um, and we then, Scott came in and he showed it to the viewers, which was, uh, I mean, it was just a harsh reminder of how life out here is really difficult for the animals. And then we see what happens with the, the lionesses. And while it can be a massively beautiful place, um, it can be quite harsh too. Celia, while I was making those uh, ridiculous renditions of animal calls, you want to know, is it allowed for guides to try and entice animals with calls? Um, absolutely it's not. That's uh, certainly not to say that people don't do it though. Um, sometimes it's totally harmless. Um, I've definitely heard of, especially back in the 80s when the, the uh, no, well, ecotourism was new and it was certainly unregulated, I've definitely heard of people, you know, we can't cross these boundaries. But like where we were with the wild dogs or hoping they were going to come across the boundary this, this morning, I've definitely heard of guides making distress calls to try and attack, attract predators across so that they can look at, um, so that they can look at them. Uh, it's not really what we'd consider ethical. I don't think it does a huge amount of harm, um, but no, it's not allowed. close by to the hyena den now. So just have a quick look and I know the old one is not active. This is a beautiful, beautiful evening.
Stein Bock running away. a stem box in there um, and we're just gonna we're nearly at the hyena den and Dennis apparently you've been a bit bedridden from an accident which is I'm very sorry to hear but you you say that if you were to walk with a limp on a bush walk we have some kudu would a predator see you differently Dennis yes I think it would but at the same, oh, there are a whole lot of them here. I've now parked Brian in possibly the worst possible position. Sorry, Brian, I'll go back and get you. A, is that a bit better? What an aged cow, the one on the right there. Um, so, Dennis, yes, I think they would see you differently, but you know, I don't think to the extent that you would necessarily be under threat. So, were you to come on a walk and you had a bit of a limp, I don't think you would attract predators to the group. But animals, de uh, as we know, predators definitely spot weakness. They spot uh, lack of condition and they spot limping and that sort of thing in their prey. So I've no reason to think that they wouldn't do exactly the same with us. Some female kudus, kudu cows. browsing away. Not a good sign when you're trying to approach a hyena den. They might not be here, but we'll give it a go anyway. Yes. Right, I think while that uh, kudu cow has her toilet, as it were, we'll press on to the hyenas and see if we can find them here. They're just down the way here. If you look through there, you can just see the termite mound where they have been resident before. Whether they still are or not, I don't know. Let's go and look. We're on a fool's errand. Oh dear. Don't fall out. hyenas here. And Jamie was saying she thought they were perhaps excavating another den, so that's possible too. I'm sure we'll find that in due course. of elephants have been around here. Lots of pushed down trees and broken stumps. Turn our lights on. It's the last little bit. Hide thee out of the way, Kudu, which thou shalt be run down. So 
So just an update on the health of Jigger. Uh, Jigger, for those of you who don't know, is the other vehicle. Um, and a couple of uh, fairly pointed questions coming from the Twitter sphere as to the possible um, issues with it. James in Kansas, you want to know if it was the gearbox or the transfer box or what the problem was. And Matthew, you want, you want to know when Jigger will be up and running. Uh, the mechanic is arriving at uh, very early bells tomorrow morning. So we're hoping to be all online by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Wendy will still have to be, have some fairly substantial work done to her. And James, for those for you, it is the transfer box. And for those of you who don't know what it is, it's not particularly interesting, so I'm not going to try and explain it. And the other reason I'm not going to try and explain it, of course, is because my mechanical knowledge is about as good as my knowledge of... Um, it's just not very good. I don't know anything about cars. But it's a fairly major flaw. So we should be up and running, both of us, by tomorrow. Afternoon, not in, not in the morning. Tomorrow in the morning you will have Brent Leo Smith on Wendy for the extent of the drive. Now we had the little story about Bob, the bachelor of Buffalo's Hook, and his lady friend, uh, Princess Daisy, the other day, or just now, at Buffalo's Hook Dam, and Princess Daisy was named by Gracie, aged eight, from Ohio. Um, and Gracie, you want to know, perhaps, has he gone to find her? Um, I think it's possible, Gracie. I hope that that's what he's gone to do, and whether or not he finds her or not, I don't know. But there, you know, as the war with a whole lot of buffalo bulls here, you know, as the, as the water gets less and less, Gracie, so the hippos have to move more and more to try and find enough so that they can live in comfortable water all the time. And here we're just going to have a quick look at these buffalo grazing out into the dusk. They tend to start grazing in the dusk. And that is a bull with a particularly unimpressive boss, and the boss is the thick covering on top of the skull out of which the horns grow. And he's got a very sort of flat one, it's like a cow. And you can hear drongos calling all around now. I'll just ask Tara to turn up the microphone quickly, and you'll just get a sound of the, the drongos calling. So you can hear the drongo calling, and it's imitating a pearl-spotted owl. It's not a pearl-spotted owl calling, it's a drongo. And there are a few of them doing it. Drongos love this time of the day. They always call now. Just as it gets dark, they come and they sit on the road. That psh is also the drongos. Psh. And I think they're really bad mimics of the pearl spotted owl. But I, so why they do it, I really I couldn't tell you. There are a whole lot of them around here doing it. <laughs> you can probably also hear the footsteps of the buffalo as they walk through this dry grass, grazing away. <laughs> old fella.
difficult time. This for buffalo, of course, because into the night they never can be too sure what's coming. But because all the lions are in such upheaval and nowhere close to where we are now, they'll probably be okay. Right, let us press on slightly. Brian, did you see a wildebeest lurking amongst this lot, or am I mistaken? There it is. I'm not mistaken, Brian. There it is. There's a wildebeest that thinks it is a buffalo. That said, if I could con a herd of buffalo into thinking I was one of them, I would live amongst them if I had to live here. Because very few, very few things will take it upon themselves to have a go to buffalo. And that's a wildebeest bull who's lurking amongst the buffalo. Beautiful dusk. Brian, just hearing a banging from my water bottle, which I'm sure you're all hearing too. It's now stopped. The dirty looks from Brian have now ceased. Thank goodness. So that lioness yesterday, or was fetched yesterday, it was killed, um, not last night, the night before, and it was fetched by the Kruger National Park, and they came to do an autopsy on it to check whether it had TB or not, because there's extensive research into the effect of bovine tuberculosis on the lions of the area. And Patricia, you want to know if that lion has been returned to the bush, or will it be returned to the bush? Um, I don't think so, no. I think especially if it is found to be infected, um, I don't think they will return it to the bush. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what they'll do with the carcass, but I think it's unlikely that they'll return it to the bush. Oops, push up. Sorry, stick placed across the road by a calcitrant elephant. Lovely update from Pamela, Robin and Sharon. Just we were talking about the big Tuskers and Duke and I, I thought that he had died and you told me that he died some time ago in 2011. So thank you for that. Um, I actually remember the, the announcement coming on the news. I think it was actually on the national news when he, when he did die and he died of old age. Some zebras there. Can we have a quick look, Brian? We'll pick him up. So I'm not going to shine a spotlight on the zebras, but you can just see them in the last embers of this day. And the camera is pretty good at picking up things that we, I mean, that's in detail that we with our naked eye cannot see. That's actually really quite amazing. <laughs> 
looks like it's broad daylight. So the zebras and the impala and the wildebeest and the buffalo would like to come and spend as much time in the open as they can during the night time. And that's obviously because it's much easier for them to see anything that might want to come and deliver some sort of nefarious death to them. In other words, lions, basically. Zebras like that are under no threat from leopard, no but big. Hyenas too, of course. But the hyenas in this area tend to be far more scavengers than they do hunters. them to graze into the dusk. It's definitely a change in the weather as we can drive along now basically to the end of dry without putting a jersey on, which is fantastic. Ryan's trussed himself up a bit, but it's not cold yet. Hello, Sarah in Ohio, aged 17. You asked some great questions. Um, and you want to know about termite mounds. We had a long discussion about termite mounds earlier. And when they get excavated and some and other animals start to live in them, so something like an art park, for example, um, do termites share it with them? Uh, Sarah, almost universally not. You know, once they get opened up, the termite mounds, often they then become dormant because the termites get eaten or the queen gets killed or something like that. And then if they don't get, if, if the queen doesn't die and the termites still survive, they then repair it very quickly. So before anything can go and live in the holes that have been excavated by the art park, um, they've normally been fixed up by the workers. They work quite quickly. So normally they won't share. light out and have a quick look around. Let's see if I can find this thing. Hold on one, one second. There we go. There it is. Got a special new filter on it, placed there by Jean Dre. I wouldn't say I see a huge difference. That means it's not quite as yellow as it was before. What do you think, Brian? This is a bit different, hey? Yeah. That's everybody, in case you're wondering, he's done that because the yellow light that we normally have on it tends to be fairly harsh in the camera. And I think you'll find this one, you might not notice the difference. It will make a difference. What is that? Hyena. I'm going to stop right here. There's a hyena coming down the road towards us. Um, as we have a lovely comment from Mark from Massachusetts, who I think has an excellent idea. He's one of our new viewers and he's hooked, he says, and he watches while he's at work. Uh, Mark, I think that's the best possible thing to do in an office. I can't imagine doing anything more productive than watching the African wild in an office. Well done to you and please keep watching and keep talking to us. There is a spotted hyena, one of which, or many of which, Jamie saw this morning. I think they provided most of the entertainment for the morning. Because Brent and I were thoroughly unsuccessful at finding anything else. Beautiful animals. And it'll be going off to forage in the night alone. And if it finds something delicious or 
something big that is perhaps being eaten by lions, it will make that whooping, cackling call and try and attract a whole lot of its clan mates to come and chase off whatever it is that's made the kill. Right. Well, everybody, um, it has been a fascinating afternoon and not always very easy to be doing three hours on our own, but made infinitely easier by the wonderful comments and questions from all of you. So thank you very much for that. We've had a lot of discussion, mainly about the lions, and we haven't seen any lions this afternoon um, because they're all on different parts of the reserve. And I imagine over the next little while we're going to be having huge discussions on the dynamics of lions. A male coalition uh, takeover like we're experiencing here does take time, doesn't happen very fast. It's quite possible that the Birmingham boys won't take over here and the Matimbas will hold them off. They're still in pretty good condition, but time will tell. A big thank you to Brian on camera. Thank you for putting up with me for this length of time. A big thank you to Louise, who's silently sitting next to me here. She's off to Johannesburg tomorrow. Poor lady. Uh, shame. She's now in tears. I'm sorry about that, Louise. And a big thank you to Tara and Jess in the final control room. And of course to the ever patient Eugene as he fixes the te technical issues that we experience. Well, none today really. We had no technical issues, just some problems with the mechanics, of course, of these Land Rovers. And that's because they are Land Rovers, I suppose. It's part of their character. So thank you all very much for your contributions. Uh, we will see you on the morning safari, which is in the morning at dawn and Brent Leo Smith will be taking that he will be his normal excitable self I'm sure and so please have a great evening morning or afternoon wherever you might be in the world it's been wonderful having you along and we'll see you in the glory of the African dawn see you tomorrow